Praise God from whom all blessings flow. My name is Pastor Tyrone P. Jones IV, and I exclusively want to welcome you to worship on today. In fact, this service was designed with you in mind. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our worship experience today. First Baptist Church of Guilford is a loving church, a warm church, an inviting church, and so we thank and praise God for you stopping by on today. If you want to know more about First Baptist Church of Guilford, you can go to www.fbcog.org. Amen. God bless you. Come on in. Let's praise the Lord together. wonderful. He is wonderful. I'm going to keep saying it until it gets in your spirit. He is wonderful. Maybe he hasn't done anything wonderful for you, but is there anybody in here like me that God has been wonderful to you? So I think we ought to take just a pause right here and give a wonderful God a wonderful praise because he is wonderful. You got to think about that. He is wonderful. He woke you up this morning and he started you on your way and he allowed you safe traveling mercies. And he is wonderful. He is mighty. He is wonderful. He is awesome. He is good. He is kind. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is wonderful. Hallelujah. He is wonderful. I almost forgot my little assignment sitting over there thinking about how wonderful God has been to me. It's, it's, things may not have always been wonderful, but he is always wonderful. Things may not be wonderful in your life, but God is always wonderful. <laughs> Giving honor to the spirit of Christ that rests, rules, and abides in this place to our wonderful pastor, Dr. Tyrone P. Jones, and to his wife, Reverend Jay, uh, to all of the leaders of this wonderful church, to the members, both in person and virtually. God bless you all. Uh, to my family who joins me here, and I see a co-worker of mine from, uh, from the job. I think people don't have to be nice to you, so you, when they are, you ought to say thank you, and so uh, persons don't have to be and I must want to, just want to take this moment uh, to offer, and certainly to Reverend Robinson, who has led us in worship on this morning. But I must, First Baptist, uh, from my family to you all, extend a public thank you, because uh, particularly to the scholarship ministry, my daughter received a scholarship from the church, and this past week she began her collegiate career at Coastal Carolina University in South Carolina, where she will major in intelligence and national security. Amen. All right, so um, I think I've covered it all. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And, uh, it's a familiar passage of scripture starts around verse 40, goes down to verse 52, and uh, within these familiar and fascinating stories, forever intertwined by the Holy Writ, uh, we find our focus verse, the verse I would like to inscribe upon your thinking on today, it is verse 50, Luke chapter 8, verse 50 says, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's a familiar passage. We work through the entire intertwining stories of this synagogue ruler named Jairus and this 
unnamed woman with the issue of blood. But the verse I want to zoom in on is that 50th verse where it says, hearing this, Jesus says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. story opens in Luke 8 verse 40 stating this a man named Jairus a ruler of the synagogue came and fell at Jesus' feet pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter a girl of about 12 is dying here is a man with status position and title who comes and falls at Jesus' feet, pleading. Some folk are too funny acting to fall, too pompous to plead, too big to bow down. But every now and then, my brothers and sisters, life will hit you below the belt, make your knees buckle, and make you bow down. Here is a man who is not ashamed He's not concerned about how he would be viewed by others. It did not matter to him what his contemporaries at the synagogue would say about him. He comes this way with no regard for etiquette or discretion because his daughter, his baby girl, his only girl of about 12 is dying. Because there are some problems that are bigger than your position some tasks that stand taller than your title, and some issues that are just flat out larger than your ego. This was not the time to be cute, my friends, not the time to act like he had it all together, not the time to run off his spiritual resume to Jesus because sickness does not segregate and death does not discriminate. It does not matter how long you've been in church, how, long, how hard you pray, how much you give, how saved you are. There are, will be some moments in life that will simply take the air out of you. And for Jairus, this is one of those moments. I wish there was someone in here who could relate and knew who I was talking about when you had a problem you could do nothing about. You couldn't buy your way out of it, couldn't think your way out of it. Money was useless. Your degree couldn't fix it. When you could not sleep, you were up pacing the floor all night long or sitting on the side of the bed crying until the deer to tear ducts dried up. It is in those moments, my friends, doesn't matter if your mascara runs. It does not matter if there's a hole in your stocking or if your tie does not match your shoe. Stuff will make you drop to your knees. Am I talking to anybody in here? Some stuff will cause you to fall at his feet. Some stuff will cause you to plead for his help. Because I don't know about you. I heard the temptation sing it. I heard TLC sing it. But I ain't too proud to beg if I got company in here. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Sometimes you just have to throw your head back and holler, help! And let me go here for just a moment. Parenthetical insert, if you will. We talk about praying mothers. And we talk about Holy Ghost filled grandmothers. But I need to give credit where credit is due, Deacon Wilcox. And this ain't mama. This ain't nana. This ain't big mama coming on behalf of the baby. This is daddy. This is daddy coming to Jesus, coming to the master, taking the lead, taking responsibility, putting his pride aside and asking and begging and pleading for help. He does not just make the baby, but he bears the burden, then takes that burden to the Lord and in search of some help because, I keep saying this, his daughter, his baby girl, about 12, she's not just sick, she just don't have a cold, she's dying. And as Jesus is on the way, a lady, a woman, verse 43, with an issue of blood, approaches him. She interrupts the journey to Jairus' house. In fact, she interrupts the entire story. And for the next six verses, verses 43 through 49, we read about this encounter and this interaction between Jesus and this unnamed woman. Meanwhile, Jairus, don't forget about him, is standing there waiting. 
I'm going to put you in Jairus' seat. He's forced to wait. He's forced to watch. And he's forced to witness Jesus dealing with this woman, restoring her and returning her to a state of wholeness while certainly in the back of his mind, he's thinking about his dying daughter. Jairus is in a waiting room. Jesus, what are you doing? I came to, you have to get into this man's psyche for just a moment. I came to you. I fell prostrate in front of all these people, pleaded with you to come and heal my dying daughter. This is critical, man. This is an emergency. Time is of the essence. There is no time to waste every second counts. I'm not too sure about you stopping like this. To deal with a lady who did not even ask you to heal her. Who even prefers to remain anonymous. I'm a little nervous, guy, about this seeming delay. I, I, I know she got an issue, but what about me? What about my issue? I was here first. My daughter, I have a daughter. My daughter is dying. You must brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, you must understand the angst and the anxiety that Jairus is feeling. It probably took him a lot to come in the first place. And now, Jesus, you're going to hold things up by stopping to deal with someone else? What about me? My daughter's not just sick. She's dying. And you put me in this proverbial waiting room. And I'm just supposed to sit here, say nothing, and wait. I'm supposed to sit here and be patient while you permit this lady to root the line, cut in front, not just of me, but cut in front of my dying daughter. Sometimes we can feel this way, like Jairus, if you will. We do all this praying, all this Bible reading, all this church attending. And yet sometimes we can feel as if the Lord has relegated us to the back of the line, addressing everybody else's issue while we sit in the waiting room. What are you doing, Jesus? And in 49, verse 49, it gets worse. Verse 49 says, while Jesus was still speaking, Someone comes from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and says to him, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Story's gone from bad to worse. Girl is no longer dying. She is dead. Now, I must speak to the method or the choice of words that the messenger used to deliver this message. I guess my bereavement senses were pricked while reading this because you don't sense any compassion or even tact with the delivery of this rather bad news. It appears to be gruff or brash or brazen. Uh, no sorry for your loss. No ease into this. Just drop it and go. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. I didn't know that my daughter was a bother to Jesus. I didn't know that my issue was, you know, a bother to him. It didn't look like he was bothered. Um, Maybe it's not Jesus. Maybe you're bothered at having to bring me the message in the first place. Nevertheless, the delivery is terrible because some people just don't know what to say. Imagine Jairus upon hearing this. He's got to be a bag of emotions. He's upset, perhaps, over the news and maybe upset with the messenger, maybe upset with himself, perhaps, for not getting to Jesus sooner. If I had gotten here sooner, maybe I could have avoided all this or... Maybe I shouldn't have come at all. After all, Jesus is not too popular with the other synagogue rulers, so maybe I shouldn't have come at all. Maybe he's upset at the lady who was the cause of the delay. He may be upset at Jesus, who due to tarrying too long with this woman, does not get to his daughter in time, and she dies. Someone else gets healed. His daughter dies. Just don't seem fair. Surely he is scared because of what now awaits him.
because he has to go back home. And yet what Jesus says in verse 50 is the crux of the text. He says, hearing this, Jesus says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. I love how Mark, Reverend Robinson, I love how Mark's gospel phrases Jesus' responses. He, it says, ignoring what they said, Jesus tells the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. I'm so glad, my friends, that Jesus' behavior in dealing with us is not dictated by others or determined by how others think or feel about us. He ignores what they said, and he says, look, man, don't be afraid, just, be, just believe. In other words, stay in the waiting room. Hearing this, the text says, hearing the impact and potential influence of the message on Jairus, that it might cause him to give up, walk away, storm out of his proverbial waiting room, because you will always find one who will say it's no use, it's all over, you may as well give up, don't bother God with your stuff, he's not listening anyway, be careful of who you allow in your waiting room. Be careful of who you allow into your emergency type of situations. And hearing this, all of this defeated and faithless talk and potential impact and influence it could have on Jairus, Jairus, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Stay in the waiting. Don't be afraid. Really, Jesus? That's what you got for me? Don't, don't be afraid. My biggest fear has come upon me. My daughter is dead. No parent expects to have to bury their child. And you say, don't be afraid. And now I have to go home and face my wife. I told her I was coming to you. I told her that everything was going to be okay. And now I got to go home to a broken wife and a shattered life. And you say, don't be afraid. It's too late, Jesus. I'm way beyond afraid. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Just believe. For I'm bigger than your situation. I know what you see might seem insurmountable for you, but nothing is impossible for me. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Just believe for I have not forgotten about you. I have not overlooked you. I have not shoved you to the side and given your blessing to someone else. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Believe that I am who you know that I am. You would not have come to me, Jairus, if you did not believe I could heal your daughter. Don't be afraid, Jairus. And I want to tell someone in here on this morning who is waiting, waiting on this pandemic to officially be over, waiting on your job to promote or at the very least appreciate you, waiting for your husband to do right, your wife to act right, your kids to straighten up and fly right, waiting for friends to get it together, waiting for your finances to come together, waiting to feel better, waiting for the pain to go away. Oh, are you waiting on God to move, waiting on God to make a way, waiting for God to step in, waiting for God to show up? Here's what I have to say to you. Stay in the waiting room. Because you see, the enemy want to frighten you. He want to make you afraid, right? The text, the Bible would say God does not give us a spirit of fear, but the enemy wants to use that. He wants to make you afraid. And so Jesus would simply say to you and I today, who are in the proverbial waiting room, waiting on our next thing, he would say, don't be afraid, just believe, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You don't like any of that. That God has not brought you this far to leave you now. And if God has done it for you before, he shall do it again. And what he has has done for others he will surely do for you don't be afraid just believe 
Perhaps instead of telling God how big your problem is, tell your problem how big your God is. That he is mighty, that he is wonderful, that he is a strong tower, that he never fails. God will either remove the issue from your life or give you the strength to shoulder it. Don't be afraid, just believe. But you see, my friends, our problem is sometimes we go to God. And then we let other folk, folk who don't even talk to God themselves, talk us out of what we went to God for in the first place. Listen, my friends, I, I, I'm not, I've lived long enough and I've learned this lesson enough. I'm not talking to you about my stuff if I am not convinced that you are talking to God about your own. I'm not going to talk to you about mine if I'm not convinced that you're talking to God about yours because then the source of your advice will be skewed. The source of your encouragement will be faulty. The source of your suggestions will be worldly at best. So I can't talk to you about stuff that's really got me hemmed up if I'm not convinced that you spend any time with no offense, no judgment. I just need my advice to come from the source of my strength. In other words, in other words, don't have any unholy, unspiritual, non-praying individual talk you out of your waiting room. Maybe this is what I should just said right from the beginning. Why? Because if you leave too early, if you leave too soon, you will fool around and miss your blessing. You will mess around and miss your healing. You will miss what God has for you. Stay in the waiting room. Don't leave there. It may be uncomfortable, certainly. It may be difficult, surely. You may have to watch other people come in after you and leave before you, but stay there. Matter of fact, while you're there, pray in the waiting room. Sing. I wish I could. I can't, so I read the words. Sing in the waiting room. Hold on in the waiting room. Stay till God speaks to you in the waiting room, till he calls for you out of the waiting room. Oh, you may not think I have said much, my friends, but the core of our relationship with Jesus is our faith. The anchor of our walk with him is our ability to believe. Paul would say it this way, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so it took a measure of faith for Jairus to come to Jesus in the first place, to believe that he could heal his dying daughter. But it has to take an additional measure of faith in the midst of this unexpected and unwanted delay to hold on, to hang on, to believe that Jesus has not forgotten about him especially now that he has to take this long walk home with the information in his head that his little girl is dead. So he's weighing in his mind what he has been told, your daughter is dead, against what Jesus has said. Don't be afraid, just believe. He's walking with Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to heal her. Jesus never said everything going to be all right. So he's leaving Jairus, and he's probably not said nothing to him on the way back. He's just left Jairus to walk and walk and work out his own faith with the only thing he has in his mind is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. But my daughter's dead. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. My daughter's dead. Don't be afraid. It had to be a very long walk home. This is why we have to hold on to what the Lord says while the world will try to weaken it, water it down, and evil wrestle it away from us. Have to hold on to his word. Because it's one thing to initially come to Christ, to offer the initial prayer, to approach a problem in faith, but it is quite another when the answer does not immediately come, when the situation is not quickly fixed, 
when it looks as if the Lord is taking his sweet time addressing your particular issue. It is in those moments when our faith is tested, it is stretched, our ability to trust and believe is pushed to the limit. And yet it is in those moments when you're behind the eight ball, back flat up against the wall, it is in those moments that call us to plant our feet, straighten our back, drive your tent peg in the ground and declare that no matter what, I'm staying with Jesus. Have I got a witness in here? Is there anybody in here who has ever had to make that declaration that in the midst of your own delay, in the midst of the naysayers, in the midst of the devil in your ear asking you, where your God now? In the midst of all of that, is there anybody in here who has ever had to say, come what may, I'm staying with Jesus. A sickness may come, but I'm staying with Jesus. Death may come, but I'm staying with Jesus. Money acting funny, but I'm staying with Jesus. Relationships are all right, but I'm staying with Jesus. Come what may, I'm staying with Jesus. Wilmington Chester Mass Choir puts it this way. I told you I didn't sing, but I read the words. Wilmington Chester Mass Choir puts it this way. What do I do when I don't know what to do? What do I say when I don't know? what to say. What are the answers to those questions that seem to have no answer? I'll just stand. Oh, y'all know the song. I'll stand still until your will is clear. I'm staying with Jesus. I'm going to stay in the waiting room. Now, I understand waiting not easy. We don't like to wait. We're very impatient people. Just go to the DMV any day of the week or go to the bank on the first of the month and you will realize how impatient or just drive anywhere in the city and you will realize just how impatient people are. But it can be said that our waiting expands our faith. It humbles us. It makes us more grateful when the answer does come. Let's face it, my friends. If we got everything we wanted when we wanted, if we never waited for anything, our faith would be weak at best, and we would not be as grateful as we are. How many of you are glad that God did not give you some things when you wanted them, but instead made you wait for them? Oh, I think I'm going to rope somebody in here now. Uh, if you got the job when you wanted it, you would be fired by now. If you got the house or the car when you wanted it, it would be foreclosed and repossessed. If you got married when you wanted it, you would be an unsatisfied single right now. But aren't you glad for God's timing? He knows when to open the door. He knows when to close the door. Uh, he, he, we might not like waiting, but aren't you glad in most cases that you did? You see, the Hebrew understanding is the nerd in me. The Hebrew understanding of waiting is quite different than our concept of waiting. The idea of waiting to the Hebrew is that I'm not only productive, but proactive while I wait. Meaning that because I trust God, meaning because I believe in God, have faith in God, I can maintain my spiritual momentum and continue to walk by faith even though I have not received what I'm waiting for. Because I know that while I'm waiting and while I'm walking, God is working it out for my good. Because Jesus is worth the wait. Have I got a witness in here? Uh, Jairus stays in the waiting room. And you know what? When Jesus finished healing the woman, it was Jairus' turn. His name came up. Here's the other title you can use for this text. You're next. <laughs> Jairus' turn came up. Deacon Will Coxon, he was next. What if I told you? You're next. What, what if I told you you were next for a blessing or next for a breakthrough or next for a healing or next for a miracle or next for an opportunity? How would you respond? Would you respond how you're looking at me right now? If I told you undeniably that you were next, would you whine? Would you complain? Would you fuss? Would you sit there like nothing is happening? Or would you praise God in expectation? Because here's what you have to understand logically. 
logically, somebody has to be next. Why not you? If somebody has to be next, why not you? Got to give it to Jairus. Got to give it to him. He does not say, forget it, Jesus. Don't, never mind. You know, we'll just make funeral arrangements and, you know, it's all right. Don't, don't worry about it. He doesn't say that. He probably grabbed him by the hand. All right, you ready now? Okay, let's go. Finally, we ready? Okay, let's go. So they're probably hastening, you know, along. And um, I'm sure it seemed like the longest walk ever. But the text says in verse 51 that when Jesus arrives at the house, the girl's pronounced dead. Jesus goes anyway, much like that Lazarus story. Right? He waits for Lazarus to be good and dead, right? Four days, thinking, all of that. Then he decides, okay, it's time to go. So in this case, he waits. She dies. He's not bothered. Jairus is a bag of emotions, but it's not bothering Jesus. So he goes anyway. And he gets to the house, and he puts out the skeptics who were crying, and then they start laughing when Jesus says she's not dead, but she's sleeping. He puts everybody out the house except the parents, Peter, James, and John. That's how I knew the man was married. See, he had to go home back to his wife. That's how you know you got to read the whole story. I read the Bible like an eight-year-old, right? So uh, uh, he takes the girl by the hand, and he says, little girl, I call my daughter little girl, little girl, get up. In Mark's gospel, it's Talitha Kum, which means little girl, get up. And she who was dead got up. Jesus has some peculiar ways. He has a way of showing up oftentimes intentionally when our situation has gotten real dark. He has this rather odd, unorthodox, and perhaps even strange habit of purposefully appearing when our backs are up against a really hard wall. He has this rather unconventional practice of deliberately arriving after all options have been exhausted and we are about to throw up our hands and wave the white flag of surrender. Jesus has some strange ways now. I, we love him, but he's got some unusual ways. Um, but that's all right, just as long as he shows up. I heard Big Mama say he may not come when you want him, but God knows when he does show up, he is right on time. Uh, stay in the waiting room. Jairus is in the waiting room. He saw Jesus heals the woman, heal the woman, but he stayed in the waiting room. In spite of his own emotions, in spite of his uh, the insensitive messenger and incompassionate mourners, he stayed until his number came up. He stayed until the doctor could see him. Is there anybody in here who remembers when you were in the waiting room? I give you a page out of my own book. Some years ago, my wife had surgery. And uh, so we go down. She goes in. She's in surgery for now. I'm, where am I? In the waiting room, right? Saints are calling. People are coming by. I don't really want to talk to nobody. If you've ever been in the waiting room, the only one you want to talk to, You don't want to talk to the nice folk that are coming by. Nurses want to give you water. All that's cute and all. The only one you want to talk to is the doctor. Anybody been there? You, you, so, so you're in the waiting room. You didn't know how long you were going to be there. You watched others come in and leave. Blessed while you were forced to stay in line. Maybe you thought God had forgotten about you, that he did not love you. He left you all alone in the waiting room. But then your name came up on the little screen or something. He called you. And how many of you know that Jesus is worth the wait? The psalmist would say it this way. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Don't like the psalmist. Job would say it this way, that in all my days of hard service, I will wait until my change comes. 
don't like Job. Isaiah puts it this way. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Stay in the waiting room. And when your number comes up, when your name is called, it simply means the doctor will see you now. And Jesus is not a simple general practitioner. When your heart is sick, He's a cardiologist. When, when your mind is messed up, he's a neurosurgeon. Able to transform you by the renewing of your mind. But here's the one I like, Deacon. The one that trumps all the others. When your soul is sick and you're in the need of a savior, he is a hematologist. For what can wash away my sins? Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Is there anybody in here? Oh, let's just pause right here and have church. Is there anybody in here who's just grateful for the blood of Jesus? Anybody glad that it's the blood that never loses its power? It comes from day to day. It gives me strength. I'm going to stay in the waiting room. In fact, in fact, in fact. The whole world, especially the saints of God, are in the waiting room. Paul says it this way. The creation wait in eager expectations for the sons of God to be revealed. That the whole creation been groaning right up to the present time. And that we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our, which simply means Jesus coming back. That's what all that means. Anybody glad that he is coming back? I'm waiting for the sky to open, waiting for him to put one foot on eternity and the other on time to come back and rescue us from the wickedness of this world and take us to a place where there will be no more crying and there will be no more pain and there will be no more pandemic and there will be no more dying where every day will be like Sunday and the Sabbath will have no end. But until then... I'm going to wait. Anybody with me? Until then, I'm going to wait until he shows up. I'm going to wait until he moves. I'm going to wait until he speaks. I'm going to wait until it's my turn. I'm going to wait until he calls my name. I'm going to wait until he says, you're next. Going to wait with my praise. Going to wait with my service. Going to wait with my worship. Going to wait with my thanksgiving. Going to wait with my hallelujah. And if I hold on and I hold out, he will surely, surely, surely bring you out. Is there anybody in here that can give God praise even in the waiting room? I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know it's frustrating. Stay in the waiting room. Sit in the waiting room. Don't let anybody talk you out of the waiting room because he's worth the wait. And if you leave too soon, what you've been asking for may be missed. Stay in the waiting room because eventually you're next. Amen. Amen.